for joining us for this webinar. The topic, as I believe you all know, is preventive cardiology and staying healthy in times of COVID-19. During the next hour, we're going to talk about concepts that you should know to stay healthy during this pandemic. I'm going to start with about a 15 minute introduction to talk about a little of the background on COVID and some of the general preventive cardiology concepts. Then we'll move on and we'll talk about heart healthy eating. This will be delivered by Fran Burke, who is our dietitian within our program. We will move on to talking about exercising while at home. And Chris Kuzmias will talk about this. He is our exercise physiologist, so he knows a whole lot about exercise. And after we give you these presentations, we will have a discussion that will be moderated by a panel with Dan Soffer and Neil Chokchi. The important information to tell all of you is that for the sake of preserving sound quality during this webinar, we are keeping everyone muted other than the speaker and the panel. So that way there aren't distracting noises, but you can still communicate with us. In Zoom, there's a chat button. And if you click on the chat and you type to us, then you will be able to communicate. Dan and Neil will be monitoring this. Sometimes they will write back to you privately or write back to the group. Other times they'll actually open it up for a live discussion that you could hear during this webinar. I'm gonna start moving on to our first topic, but before I do that, I just want to first of all, thank my faculty for spending the time and effort to put this together, as well as all of our background support with Linda and Abby and their teams. It takes a lot of work to put together a webinar and get people together. So thank you all for working as a team to make this happen. It's something that we really wanted to do for our patients, friends, family, and the Penn community. So thank you to everyone. By way of background, my name is Douglas Jacoby and I am a cardiologist and also a lipidologist, meaning I specialize in cholesterol management and I serve as medical director of our Center for Preventive Cardiology and Lipid Management. So let's go to the basics. What is COVID-19? I think many of you will know uh, know what I have on this slide, but I want to make sure we all start with the same playing field. So, COVID-19. It is caused by a virus. The virus is called the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. In other words, SARS-CoV-2. And this is new to humans as of late 2019. It's transmitted both airborne and on surfaces. In other words, if you are standing close enough to someone who breathes on you and they are infected, you can catch the virus. Or if someone with COVID touches a surface and you touch it and then touch yourself, you can catch the virus. It enters the body through our eyes, nose, and mouth. So those are the entry ports to infect us. As a respiratory virus, the main source of impact on our body is the lungs. But one of the features we're learning about COVID is that it actually is a multi-organ impact. It affects lots of organs, including the heart. So by attacking the heart, this coronavirus causes inflammation. And we are seeing people present to the hospital with chest pain and EKGs that look like they're having a traditional heart attack. But in fact, their arteries are perfectly fine. They don't have a blockage, they don't have a stent. What they have is cardiac inflammation. And it looks like it's mirroring a heart attack. We're also seeing acute heart failure and heart rhythm problems caused by the coronavirus. There are other relevant problems as well in the system. For example, we're seeing increased clotting. So we're getting blood clots in vessels, and as you can imagine, that causes additional issues. So COVID-19 is not as simple as a viral pneumonia, although that is the predominant problem with this virus. Why is it so dangerous? Well, there are a couple of features that make COVID-19 dangerous to everyone. First of all, it's contagious before it's symptomatic. So you can be talking to someone who feels 100% perfect, 
not a symptom in the world, but because they're infected, they're breathing out coronavirus, which means if you're close enough, you can breathe in coronavirus and actually catch it. Or if they infect a surface and you touch the surface and touch your mouth, you can catch it. So the contagious before symptomatic is a big piece right now, as is the fact that since this is new to humans, we have no immunity to COVID-19. Okay, so every person who gets exposed hasn't had it before and doesn't have any resistance. And because of the severe and multi-organ impact, some people are getting very sick with it. So here's our experience at Penn. In the last six to seven weeks, we've treated over 1,200 patients with COVID-19 within the health system. And that is really remarkable if you think about it, because two months ago, we hadn't treated any. So that is a big surge of patients hitting our hospitals. And people that come to the hospitals are getting very sick. So about 25% of people that are sick enough to get admitted to the hospital require intubation and being put on a ventilator. Unfortunately, once people get that sick, there's a high mortality rate. Um, reports are pretty consistent that once you're sick in the intensive care unit, over 50% of people unfortunately die. So all in, once people are hospitalized, mortality rates are about 15%. And that's what makes this virus scary to people. Now, the good news is most people don't get sick enough to require hospitalization. But if they do, we need to take it very seriously. So who's at risk for getting COVID? The short answer is everyone, no matter how young, how old, how sick, how healthy, everyone can get this and everyone can have a severe case, which is why everyone should be careful. That being said, there are definitely people who are higher risk. And by higher risk, we mean roughly two to six times the risk of people without any risk factors. Age, as you get older. Hypertension, which is high blood pressure. Cardiovascular disease, so any heart or vessel related problems. Diabetes, obesity or being overweight, and lung disease. And what I want you to look at and notice is on this list, on this list right here with everything, these are the standard cardiovascular risk factors. These are the things that you already come to us in preventive cardiology and sports medicine to see and to work on. So a lot of what we deal with you are the things that make people more at risk for a bad outcome with COVID and the things that even during this pandemic, we wanna focus with you to keep these factors all under good control. Of course, we can't modify age, but we can control blood pressure, control diabetes, control obesity, and do heart healthy living that will actually afford you some protection, although we can't eliminate risk. So should you buy anything for your house? Should I buy anything for my house? Different because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Well, before this came out, I thought almost everyone should have a blood pressure cuff at home. Get an arm cuff, automated. It lets you monitor yourself and get a lot more data. My thought hasn't really changed that much with the pandemic, other than it might be even more important now because we're having less visits with our providers. And because we're having less visits with providers, we're getting less monitoring. So I think the blood pressure cuff at home has extra utility right now. A pulse oximeter. That's a device to measure your oxygen levels. That's something I typically have not thought most people needed at home, but I do think it could be useful now. COVID, when it affects you, because it's a virus infection of your lungs, causes a viral pneumonia, people's oxygen levels can decrease. And one of the interesting features of COVID is they can decrease your oxygen levels without people noticing as much as they typically would have. Some people are presenting to the hospital very sick with very low oxygen levels that typically they would have presented to hospitals much earlier. So having a pulse oximeter at home to monitor your oxygen level, if you happen to get sick, but are feeling good enough to monitor at home, 
could provide some extra useful information for you. Thermometers, because most people that get a COVID infection have fevers. Reusable masks for going outside. Partially, this is to protect you from breathing in the virus if you happen to get close to someone, but that's not perfect protection. Part of it is to stop you from touching your own mouth and nose. And part of it is to protect those around you because if you happen to have caught COVID, this helps prevent the spread to the loved ones and friends around you. So overall, when you're going outside, I do think reusable masks for now are the way to go. And also, you could consider wearing glasses because remember I told you, you can get COVID through your eyes. This would partially be to diminish exposure to your eyes and partially just to stop you from rubbing your eyes. I don't feel strongly about it, but I think it's a reasonable thing to do. If you look at the picture on the right, this is my youngest son and we are outside, note the mask, but also note right around his elbows, right where I'm pointing are bands. Those are to hold on elbow protectors because we were going outside to rollerblade in front of our house when the street wasn't crowded. And my point here is to say, even though we're being very careful for safety precautions, you should still be going out and exercising and being active, just following standard safety procedures, including elbow protection if you're on rollerblades. Does COVID change preventive cardiology management? Well, life is a balance, okay? It's a balancing act. On the one hand, there is no change to the standards. By that I mean, you should have been eating healthy and you should continue to eat healthy. You should have been exercising and you should continue to. Our recommendations are a half hour, five times a week. So about two and a half hours a week or more um, would be wonderful. And if you happen to have even more time during this pandemic, increasing the exercise is always good. Monitor your blood pressure at home like we spoke about and take your medicines. And this is real important. Nothing about this virus changes the need for you to stay on your normal medicines. And I'll give you one of the interesting examples out there. So there's a category of medicines called ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Those are blood pressure medicines. They overlap with one of the mechanisms that COVID uses when it's affecting your body. Some people think that being on these medicines increases your risk. So they've been stopping them. Some people think that being on these medicines might decrease your risk by competing with the virus. So they've been giving them. So we simultaneously have research protocols going on, removing the medicine and giving the medicine. And that points to the fact that we really don't understand enough about this virus to know what the right answer is. And we are desperately looking for everything we can do to help. The most recent data from the last week suggest that these medicines have no impact. And when they looked at China for about two months, they didn't see being on or off these medicines had any impact on severity or survival. So for right now, we'll keep our eyes open to the impact of medications on this. But the big thing I want you to know is please continue to take your medicines. So none of that has changed. But on behalf of things that have changed, well, we've switched to video visits. I'm giving you all a webinar when in the past we would have done a live conference. Lab work has been delayed. Usually as a cholesterol specialist, I'm always looking at everyone's cholesterol. Most of my patients this month haven't even had it checked, but that's okay. The medications we use are so safe that delaying lab work while we're in the midst of the peak of the pandemic isn't a problem. And video visits just to check in and make sure things are stable are completely appropriate and still providing adequate health care. So overall, what we're seeing is a shift in philosophy for the time being. Previously, as a prevention specialist, I've worked to optimize risk, to lower it as much as I possibly can. But in the time of a pandemic, isn't necessarily the time to rock the boat. It's not necessarily the time to push way beyond the guidelines. It's the time to have a stable regimen. So as long as your numbers are pretty good in meeting general guidelines, as long as you are feeling good on your medications without side effects, then more often than I did in the past, I'm keeping things the way they were for now. 
And the medicines we give you are all about cumulative benefit. But this benefit occurs over the course of years and decades. So delaying additional tweaks and additions to your regimen by six months or even 12 months really has very little impact in the long term. So for now, the philosophy is let's keep everyone safe, let's keep them healthy, and make sure the basics are being covered. So what should I do about medical care during COVID? One important feature to know is that more people are dying at home during this pandemic than they did before. A lot more people. Some of this is due to COVID-19, but some of this is due to patients without COVID-19 who are afraid to seek health care for their problems because of the pandemic. And that's what I want to discourage. So Penn has remained open for all essential and time-sensitive services. This whole time, we never shut down. Our cardiac care has never stopped. Only elective, truly elective things have been delayed. And we're gradually resuming all of those services as we can, emphasizing patient safety. So we have many, many resurgence committees working on how to get patients through in a safe way to protect patients and protect our staff, but provide the same exact care we did before. So here's my advice in the short term. For routine care, in other words, if you have no symptoms and you feel perfect, for the time being, televisits are the way to go. They still let us provide high quality care. And I would delay live visits and testing until all the appropriate safety measures are in place for that particular test or visit. And we'll let you know. But if you have symptoms, if you are not feeling right, if you're having chest pain or shortness of breath or lightheaded or palpitations or any symptoms, please don't ignore them. Call your doctors, set up visits. If they're severe, go to an emergency room. But importantly, don't ignore them because once again, we are seeing people die at home of things just because they are avoiding healthcare. We are open and operational for everything you need. So if you don't feel right, seek care the same way you would have if you weren't in the middle of a pandemic. And lastly, I just want to make a point that this is probably going to go on for quite some time. Now, my crystal ball is not perfect. I don't know when this is going to end. But what I know is for it to really wind down, for us to truly be safe, and return to normalcy. We either need a vaccine or effective treatments, and none of those are gonna happen in the next few weeks. So we're learning how to resume life with safety precautions, but we have to remember to sleep, relax, and find enjoyment while being healthy and while being safe. And with that, a lot of great organizations are posting things for free to help people. So we have musicals with Andrew Lloyd Webber, Cirque du Soleil, we have opera, there's lots of kids programming out there as well. So my point is find things that you like, look online and do things to enjoy yourself and relax and get used to this new norm as it continues to evolve rapidly. With that, thanks for your attention. I'm going to stop my slides now and we'll begin a transition to Fran to talk about healthy eating in general and especially in times of the pandemic. Doug, it's uh, Dan Soffer here. I just wanted, while Fran is bringing that up, I wanted to throw out a couple questions at you. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so this came from one of the attendees. It's a, it's a very interesting question. If you've self-isolated for a month and you're really by yourself and within your house, do you have to continue washing your hands to keep from catching the virus? In theory, if you had truly perfectly self-isolated, I would say no, because there's no way the virus would be in your house. Unfortunately, that reality isn't perfect because most of us are still receiving mail. A lot of us have moved towards a lot of delivery services, so packages are still coming in. And if not, you're probably going out to get groceries and other items. So you've probably continued to have some baseline exposure. In that case, my recommendation is to continue to wash your hands. But yes, in theory, if you've managed to perfectly isolate the world, you don't have to wash your hands to protect just from yourself. 
Uh, along the same lines, uh, another sort of follow-up question. I, a patient asked me this today. She said she covers her skin up, her neck, her arms, her hands. She has to take an Uber to work. Is that a good idea? Do you have to cover your skin? So the entry portal of COVID into your body, once again, is eyes, nose, and a mouth. That is what you really have to protect. But in fact, COVID can live on surfaces, and some surfaces it only lives on hours, some on days. So my suggestion for you is the more covered you are, probably the better, but you don't have to be perfect. I do think it is reasonable if you've been in Ubers and been out all day and you think you've not been able to socially distance as much as you like, when you get home and you're entering your house, I think it is reasonable and appropriate to change your clothing and maybe even shower to just decontaminate yourself so you're not introducing anything from the outside world into your house. And that way you're keeping your house as a clean space. Great, thank you. It looks like Fran is ready and available to talk. So let's move on to her presentation. All of us are going to stick around after the presentations for more questions and more discussion. Thanks everyone. Hello, my name is Fran Burke. I'm the clinical dietitian with the Preventive Cardiology Program. And today I'm going to speak to you about heart healthy eating during COVID-19. The American Heart Association recommends that all Americans follow a cardioprotective dietary pattern, which is low in saturated and trans fats, high in fiber, reduced in sodium, and limited in red meat, processed meats, and uh, sugar and um, sugar and refined starches and sugar sweetened beverages. It should include fresh fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, fish and other sources of low fat proteins, low fat dairy, and healthy fats. Saturated fat is most responsible for increasing cholesterol levels. It is a solid fat at room temperature and it's found mostly in animal products. And sources include butter, whole fat dairy, such as whole milk and cheese, fried foods, fatty meats, processed foods, such as bacon. It's also found in tropical oils, such as coconut oil, which is a main ingredient in these plant-based Beyond Burgers. So what about dietary cholesterol and eggs? The American Heart Association recommends that we eat less than 300 milligrams of dietary cholesterol a day. And in fact, recent survey data has showed that most Americans are doing just that. Cholesterol is a fat-like substance. It's found only in animal products. And major sources include egg yolks, shellfish, and organ meats, such as liver. But these foods are relatively low in saturated fat and can be included in a heart healthy diet in moderation. The whole egg together, the yolk plus the white, is our best source of protein. It has all the essential and non-essential amino acids we need for health and well being. Most studies have suggested that one egg per day is not associated with increased risk of heart disease or stroke in healthy adults. However, people with heart disease or at increased risk of heart disease, I generally recommend that they eat no more than two to four egg yolks a week. Unlimited egg whites they can include, and also egg beaters. So animal protein is a major source of saturated fat and cholesterol in our diets. So you should try to vary your sources of protein. It's recommended that we eat more skinless white meat poultry, 
that we include a fish meal at least once a week. It's been my experience counseling patients that most individuals eat fish outside the home. And that might be because they don't feel comfortable preparing fish or other household members don't particularly care for fish. So in that case, you still can benefit from eating canned tuna or canned salmon, using it, adding it to salads and sandwiches or making tuna or salmon patties. But you should consider replacing animal protein with non-protein sources, such as tofu, beans and legumes, which could be made into hearty soups, stews, vegetarian chilies, including hummus and peanut butter and nuts in your diet as other non-meat protein sources. The recommendation is to replace saturated fat with unsaturated fat. And there's two types of unsaturated fat. There's your monounsaturated fats, which have been most associated with the Mediterranean diet. And that includes olive oil, canola oil, your nut butters, nuts, and avocado. Many of my patients have begun to use avocado oil because of its high smoke point, meaning that it can withstand high heat uh, before it breaks down. Polyunsaturated fats include your vegetable oils, corn, sunflower, and soybean oils. All of these oils are heart healthy. You might wanna choose olive oil for your salads, or a canola oil or a soybean oil to cook with. But one key concept to understand is that fat is very calorie packed. And one tablespoon can provide 150 calories. So you should be mindful when you cook with oil and measure amounts so that you're not increasing the calorie content of the meal. We should be increasing fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. They are a major source, a rich source of fruits and vegetables, which can help to boost our immune system. It is suggested that we make half our plate fruits and vegetables. If you're diabetic, should be more vegetables than fruit because fruit has a lot of natural sugar. And half your grains should be whole grains. Examples of whole grains include oats and barley, brown rice, quinoa, and popcorn. The evidence, we know that the coronavirus is not transmitted through food, but still as a general practice, you might wanna thoroughly wash your fresh fruits and vegetables. You can choose any form, fresh, frozen, or canned, but if you're buying frozen vegetables, you wanna to try to avoid those with butter and cheese or cream sauces, because that would add saturated fat to a food that does not contain any saturated fat. And canned fruits should be packed in water or their own juice, and not in light or heavy syrup. And to increase your daily servings of fruits, vegetables, or whole grains, it's a good idea to try to incorporate them into snacks. You can snack on low-fat popcorn in place of pretzels, which are more of a refined source of carbohydrate. You can use low-fat salad dressing as a dip for vegetables, and even hummus for a dip for vegetables, if you like. Putting peanut butter in celery or on apples is another good idea to try to increase your intake of fruits and vegetables. Meal planning is especially important during this time. The pandemic has changed our food consumption patterns. We are choosing to eat more comfort foods, 
more foods that are convenient and easy to prepare, such as macaroni and cheese, frozen pizzas, even hot dogs. Meal planning will also help us with social distancing because it will minimize the amount of time going to the supermarket. It will also help us to balance those high fat foods with other healthier choices. So decide what works for your family and try to come up with a two week meal plan that includes a mix of fresh, frozen, and shelf stable foods. I've included a list of grocery shopping tips. Many of them you've probably heard before, such as trying to shop during off peak hours or utilize the senior hours if you're a senior, which is usually first thing in the morning. Remember to wash your hands when you return from food shopping and also after you put your groceries away. And I would also recommend that you uh, wipe down the surfaces, especially where you had laid out your groceries. You might want to seek alternatives to shopping in the grocery store. You can shop online where you can get delivery to the home or curbside pickup. But this has been challenging as at best. I'm sure most of you have tried. Uh, usually uh, you might be able to secure a spot about two weeks out. But other alternatives include going to a farmer's market or joining a community supported agriculture program. Contacting food distributors who were used to be delivering to restaurants and now they're delivering to individual homes. You can also think outside the box and shop for your household goods, your cleaning supplies and your paper goods at places such as Staples, Lowe's or a Home Depot. And then there's always the gas station convenience form at store if you need to pick up some bread, milk or eggs. And finally, I've included a list of resources here that deal with heart health, meal planning, provides easy to prepare recipes, and I also want to point out that the marketing department here at Penn Medicine has a blog that deals with nutrition and fitness. It's been checked for accuracy. In fact, I've checked many of their posts. Um, they're informative, interesting, uh, and I think you should try to check them out. So uh, that ends my presentation. Thank you for listening. Anybody has any questions? Thank you, Fran. There, uh, Dan, Dan back here again. Um, there was a, uh, a really good question um, and maybe we can answer it together. I want to I want to point out I, I didn't have a chance to tell you about this um, before, but I was able to shop at my grocery store without actually um, going through checkout. My grocery store has one of those checkout guns and you can bag your food as you go. And it's really quite easy. You can bag all your food as you go, and then you just uh, pay for it at the customer service desk on the way out. So that was another uh, way to minimize. I'm still, you know, walking past people in the store, but it's really minimizing face-to-face -face, uh, contact with checkout people and, that, and the like. But the question from the audience was a very good one. It's about uh, veg being a vegetarian. So do vegetarians have lower cholesterol than meat eaters? That's, I guess, part one. And then uh, there was sort of an implicit uh, suggestion that they have better blood flow. And, and, and I, can, I can address that if you feel more comfortable about that. But um, can you tell us about the impact of being a vegetarian on cholesterol? So vegetarian is not necessarily heart healthy. If we talk about vegetarian, it could mean a number of things. It could mean that maybe you're just not eating meat, but you're eating cheese, you're utilizing whole milk, full fat dairy, so your diet can indeed be high in saturated fat. So if you are using low fat dairy products, avoiding cheese, 
that yes, indeed, a vegetarian diet can be heart healthy, as long as it's including vegetables, whole grains, and the majority of calories are not taken up with refined sources of carbohydrate. That's great. Yeah, I mean, we've seen so many of our patients who are vegetarian, but they, they take in a lot of processed food, a lot of refined food, and, and oftentimes a lot of starches, and their, their cholesterol profile is not high cholesterol per se. They have very high triglycerides though, and low HDL cholesterol, and are at higher cardiovascular risk and have insulin resistance, which can impact blood flow and, and other things. So it's a complicated, multiple factor, factors involved. Correct, and I have the time um, to do a deeper dive into their diet history. Uh, unlike the physician who needs to deal with multiple issues, um, I be able to uh, seek out exactly what they're eating. Yep. And just to add to that general concept, remember part of one's cholesterol level is genetically determined. Correct. In fact, roughly speaking, 70% of one's cholesterol level is genetically determined. So the level is really an interaction of a genetic predisposition and the lifestyle. And that's really why we like to use brand to help guide people towards healthier eating, Chris to help guide people towards more exercise. Um, but some people with genetically high cholesterol, even if they're doing everything perfectly, would still have high cholesterol. And with that, maybe this is the right time to transition to Chris, who looks like he's ready to talk. Uh, so Chris, take it away. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much. So um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Chris Kuzmiez. I'm an exercise physiologist with the uh, Penn Sports Cardiology and Fitness Program. So I'm going to talk to you today about how we can keep our exercise routines going during this crazy time where, where things have really been changing for us. So, um, you know, exercise might not be the, the top priority for us right now. You know, we're worried about trying to work from home, home uh, homeschooling the kids, trying to keep our communities and our, and our families safe. Um, but we still should really try to keep our exercise up as, as best as possible. Um, and, and many of us rely on going to the gyms and fitness centers, and they've had to close their doors. So that's eliminated that option for us. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about maybe some alternatives, uh, things you can do at, at your house to at least bridge the gap between you know, these, these times where we have to just stay at home and, and, and uh, socially isolate ourselves to when we can finally get back to the gyms and kind of doing our normal routine. So, so that's what I'll, I'll talk about today. So let's get right into it. So uh, I want to start out just by saying for the American Heart Association for cardiovascular health, they recommend that we get 150 minutes of exercise per week. All right. And that can be broken down you know, if you look at it as five days a week for 30 minutes, um, we can, we can do that. Um, or we can actually, you know, change it up a little bit, but the, the, the real goal here is to get, get the exercise throughout the week. Okay. Um, and we really want to focus on moderate exercise for the majority of, of participants, um, especially if you haven't been exercising in a long time, or you've been really inconsistent with your exercise, you probably want to stick with the moderate intensity um, rather than going toward the vigorous side. But if you've been, if you've been an avid exerciser and you were, you were exercising vigorously before all of this, this happened and all this uh, self-isolation occurred, then you can, you can still continue with your, your vigorous exercise. And you can see on the screen there that as long as you're, you're doing it at a, an appropriate level, it's, it's a higher, more vigorous level, you don't necessarily need as much time because you're working out harder. So typically we say three 25 minute sessions of vigorous exercise is roughly equivalent to 150 minutes at that moderate intensity. And you can see some of those, uh, some of those examples on the screen there as to what constitutes uh, moderate versus vigorous. But the bottom line is stay as active as you can for it to really be an exercise and a cardiovascular conditioning uh, session. We've got to get that heart rate up a little bit. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the key here. We should notice our breathing rate goes up a little bit. We shouldn't be able to hold a full conversation. Um, that's how we'll kind of know that we're at an appropriate exercise level. So another huge aspect to uh, strength training or to uh, exercise is strength training. Um, you know, a lot of us we, we use the gym equipment. You know, we use the the free weights there. We use the strength machines there. Or we go to different classes at the gym, but we don't have that option right now. So we've got to kind of come up with some alternatives 
to at least keep our strength up where it was, or if we haven't been doing strength training, you know, now would be a good time to start for, for individuals. Something they might have a little bit more time on their hands. Um, and, and we'll talk about maybe some alternative ways or some things you have around the house that you can, you can really get this program going. But what you see on the screen there is the recommendations from the American College of Sports Medicine. So we're re recommending that you, you strength train two to three times a week. Um, and the intensity, it should be enough that you feel some fatigue at the end of the exercise uh, strength training session. Um, you know, if you don't really feel any muscle fatigue, it may not have been enough resistance or there might not have been enough repetitions. Um, so you should feel a little bit, a little bit of fatigue from that. And you'll see there one that wants you to do, you know, between eight and 12 repetitions and repeat that maybe two to two to four times. Um, and we really want to try to target the major muscle groups of the body. So we're looking at like the chest, the shoulders, the legs, the back, and you really don't need a lot of different exercises to do that. You know, typically eight to 10 and you'll be able to get a, a good solid program going. Now also with strength training it's important to, to do a full range of motion when you're strength training so that we kind of take our joints through that full range that they're capable of moving and it helps keep our flexibility there as well. Um, but you also take, take breaks between the sets if you need to especially if you're someone who's just starting out with this or it's been a, a long time since you've done any kind of strength training you might have to ease into it a little bit more than someone who's been doing this consistently for years. Um, so taking breaks between sets um, is probably a, probably a good idea. Um, another key uh, point with strength training is that you need to take a break and not train the same muscle group day after day. Our muscles need some time to, to rest and recuperate. So we wanna give it a few days in between each of those training sessions and that's why doing it two or three times a week is, is really great because it gives us enough time in between those sessions for our muscles to recover and rebuild. Also, really uh, important part to strength training is not holding your breath. Um, this is important, particularly with our, our, some of our cardiac patients, those that have high blood pressure. We want to make sure that you're, you're breathing while you're strength training. If you find that you're lifting a weight that might be a little too heavy, we tend to kind of want to hold our breath to help us force through that lift. But the problem is our blood pressure can rise and it kind of goes up pretty quick. So we want to, want to avoid that. So make sure that you're breathing the whole time when you're, when you're strength training. We like you to breathe out on the exertion part. Um, but if you kind of forget and get that mixed up, as long as you're breathing regularly throughout the, the, the lifting session, you should be fine. All right, so one of the questions, you know, we, it's kind of, a, kind of a hot topic right now, and, and we get some of these questions is, you know, should I be wearing a mask if I'm exercising outdoors? Um, and it's a good question. You know, it, it's, it, I think it's warranted to, to ask something like that. So I just want to go back and start by saying, you know, the CDC recommends that if you're going out in, in public and you can't guarantee that you're going to maintain that social distance, um, then it's recommended that you use some kind of cloth face cover. Um, but I think what this really comes down to is there is sort of a common sense factor here that we have to, we have to use. If you're someone you're running in a very rural environment outdoors and you're never going to come across another person, the using a mask probably isn't going to really matter for something like that. However, if you're someone who's running through the city, you're cycling through the city, you're coming to intersections, to crosswalks, to, to traffic lights, and there's other people on the corner, and obviously, you should be wearing a mask at that point because uh, maintaining social distancing is going to be very difficult when there's others are around. So, so there's a few things that we can do to kind of kind of help lessen um, you know coming across other individuals when we're exercising outdoors. You know, number one, obviously, exercise alone. You know, if you're going to go outside and run or walk or cycle, try to do that alone. This way, you're you're not uh, with a, with a large group or you're not with other other individuals. Um, try to pick a route or a route that is, you know that there's not going to be that many people or you know there's not going to be anybody on, on that route. Um, for example, some people like to run trails and they'll never come across another person on the trail. And, you know, that, that'll be a great social distancing uh, uh, measure there. Try to adjust the time of day. You know, if, if you know that there's more people out at lunchtime exercising, 
then maybe you want to try earlier in the morning or maybe mid-afternoon where there's not as many people out on the streets or on the sidewalks. Um, so try to, try to adjust the time of day because we really just want to, want to, we want you to exercise. We want you to keep the cardiovascular fitness going, but we also don't want you to put yourself at risk by coming too close in, in contact and, and negating that social distancing that, that we need to maintain right now. So um, a few other things I want to mention about masks though. Number one, if you're going to wear any kind of mask or face covering when exercising, obviously there's a physical barrier there you know, covering your nose and your mouth. So it's going to make breathing a lot harder than if you didn't have that on. And with exercise, you know, we're just taking in higher volumes of air and we're blowing out higher volumes of air. So it's really going to restrict, all, you know, our performance or ability to exercise at previous levels. So you want to probably back off a little bit on the intensity, back off maybe on the distance or the duration that you go, at least until you can kind of get a sense of, is that mask really going to hamper my, my ability when I exercise? The other thing about wearing masks with exercise is it's going to create this very hot, humid environment on your face. And you have to just be careful because you want to make sure that you're, you're either going to uh, replace that mask on a regular basis or wear something that is washable so that we don't have to worry about bacteria and you know, your sweat on them. We just need to eliminate those, those uh, um, areas that, that could cause you some discomfort down the line. So make sure that you're, you're really taking, taking that into account as well. Try a different kind of mask. If one is feeling really restrictive, you know, there's um, you know, the surgical type masks, there's people are wearing handkerchiefs, people have some, some tighter fitting ones. Um, find one that's gonna work for you um, if one's really bothering you while you exercise. So one of the other uh, huge things right now is that most people that were using gym equipment, they were using that gym equipment for tracking their heart rates or their mileage or their speed or distance, things like that. But since the gyms are closed, the fitness centers are, are closed, they're, they're not having that option available to them right now. So one of the great things with the new wearable technology that's out there is that it can do a lot of that for you and it gives you a lot of information, a lot of self-awareness. Um, and they come in all different price ranges, all different bells and whistles on these. Um, but it'll really help, it'll help motivate you, help kind of keep you consistent, um, help you keep working toward those goals that you may have set for yourself. Um, so some people use them for, for step counts. How many, how many steps am I getting in a day? Um, things like that. So it's great, and you want to make sure that you're you're getting those steps in if that's your if that's something that you've been tracking for the last several months, or maybe you're new to it. But shooting for something like six to eight thousand steps a day is a pretty good goal for most people that are just starting out with exercise. You know, sometimes we hear about ten thousand steps a day. Well, that's that's a lot to get ten thousand steps in a day, and for beginners, it's probably an unrealistic goal. I think it's a long-term goal that we can we can shoot for, but in the in the short term, probably six to eight thousand steps a day would be be more beneficial. So what we do is we put together some exercise hacks, is what we're calling them. Some different ways or some different ideas or tips that you can use to keep your exercise routine going, even if you you don't have all the equipment that the gym has or all the all the cardiovascular training devices that they have. You know, we, we still want to keep our exercise sessions going, maintain our cardiorespiratory fitness, maintain our strength just by doing stuff at home. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to kind of run through uh, several different slides here, maybe give you some ideas and some tips on, on things we can do. So the first one here is body weight exercises. Body weight exercises are great, right? There's very minimal equipment required, if any. Um, and it can be really modified and adjusted based on fitness levels abilities. Um, some of them might have orthopedic issues or limitations, you know, musculoskeletal in injuries or limitations. Someone in that situation would want to do something like you see the lady there in the, in the chair. There's chair exercise programs, complete programs that are designed around limitations, and, and you can get a, a full workout that way. Or for those that are, that are you know, much more advanced or they're, you know, maybe they're an athlete, you know, you want to keep that cardiorespiratory fitness up. You know, something like jump roping, which is considered a high intense activity, that's going to be great for keeping your heart rate up and, and getting that cardiovascular benefit. So what's great about bodyweight exercises, very minimal equipment needed, 
you can train a lot of different muscle groups um, in a very small little work area in, in your house. Um, there's a lot of different ways to, to do that and, and modify those. Another uh, kind of tip or hack we have out there is that, you know, use, use one of these virtual chats that, that are out there, you know, FaceTime, Skype. You know, maybe you worked out with a, a fitness buddy in the past. Now with social uh, distancing, we're not able to uh, work out together, you know, in the, in the sense of, of being right next to each other or being in the same class. But now you can actually use you know, your, your smartphones. You know, you have your smartphone on while you're taking a walk. Your friend has their smartphone on, your video camera going when they're walking in their neighborhood. And you guys can at least keep that social, uh, social interaction going even though you're not, not right next to each other. Um, you know, or you can kind of look at each other while you're doing, doing strength routines and kind of encourage each other and kind of uh, keep, each, keep each other accountable um, while, you're, while you're exercising. So I think this is another great option that, that's out there right now with our, with our technology. Also with, uh, with fitness classes, you know, the gyms have, have taken a, a, a big hit on this. You know, the gyms have had to close um, some of the big companies, you know, Planet Fitness, they're, they're offering what they're calling work-ins, where they're streaming these fitness uh, classes online so that you can work in your home to get your workout. Um, so kind of kind of neat how they're doing that. Same thing with Orange Theory. Orange Theory, you know, most people would go there you know, for, the, for the classes and, and get the interaction with, with the other uh, participants. But now they're also streaming things online so that you can, you can work out in your house. And, and a lot of these things are actually free right now. So it's, it's really nice to take advantage of those. Even Peloton, Peloton is offering 90 day uh, free trial um, for their fitness classes online. And you don't even need to have the, the bike or the treadmill to, to do these classes. So a lot of, a lot of great things that are happening from, from the uh, fitness standpoint, um, things that we can do in our house now that maybe before we couldn't, or we had to pay for it before. But I also don't want to don't want you to forget about your local gyms and fitness centers. You know, many of the trainers or the uh, the fitness instructors that, that were working there, they're trying to keep keep their their clientele going. So they're even offering or streaming some different classes online as well. So you might want to check with your local fitness centers to see if they're still offering any kind of classes or um, any kind of streaming that, that, that they're doing. So maybe you don't have very much equipment in your house um, and you still want to try to keep a, a really good exercise regimen going. So here's some different ideas I'm going to throw at you for some alternative equipment, right? So um, for individuals that, that they like to cycle outside, maybe they're, maybe they're not so comfortable exercising out there. They're, they're going to come across a lot of individuals out on the streets and then they're not real comfortable with that. So what you could actually do is turn your, your, your uh, road bike into a stationary trainer at home. You, know, you buy the, the, the bike trainer um, and then you're able to exercise anytime. doesn't matter if it's raining, what the temperature is, what time of day it is. You know, you'll have, now you'll have a stationary bike at home. So that's a, that's a great option. Um, and even simple stuff like you see the lady there with the, with the, the milk jug filled with water. You know, filling that with a, with a gallon of water is going to weigh about eight pounds. So that turns that milk jug into a nice eight pound weight. You know, it can substitute for a dumbbell or kettlebell. Um, and it also has a nice built in handle on there. So you got to get a little creative. You know, if you have soup cans, you know, they'll weigh a pound or a pound and a half. Water bottles, um, you can use those as, as light weights. And all of these things are really scalable. There's someone that may not be familiar with exercise at all. And we can, we can sort of introduce, you know, light, light weights someone who has been exercising quite a bit and they're they're used to heavier weights then you might want to do something like put weight in the backpack you know put sacks of flour in there sugar water bottles so now instead of the push-up just being your regular body weight push-up now you've added resistance to it and you've made that push-up more challenging um, and then for those that that aren't used to exercising or again might have orthopedic limitations you can see the lady there in the chair with the exercise bands. You know, the resistance cords are great. You can do complete workouts with resistance bands, and you can even do certain exercises from a seated position if, if your balance might be off or maybe you have knee or back problems. So a lot of different varieties and abilities that, that, that can, this can, can address. You see the one uh, gentleman there, he has the, what we call the TRX suspension uh, system. Um, it's great, it's very portable. You can strap it to above a door. It can get uh, 
strapped around a tree to a chain link fence as the attachment point. And then you use your body weight and leverage uh, to create the resistance. So a total body workout with just a simple strap and some handles. So, so a lot of different options out there. Um, you know, some you can find around your house. Maybe if you were to buy one or two items, you kind of turn your house into a kind of a mini gym. But the goal is you want to try to keep yourself going with, with these exercises. And then the last uh, exercise kind of tip or hack that we have is to use an exercise app. You know, there's, there's tons of them out there on the market these days. Um, you know, if you were to go to the, you know, the, the, the uh, Apple uh, Play or the Google Play Store, the Apple Store, you're going to see hundreds, if not thousands of different fitness apps out there. You know, some specialize in weight loss, some specialize in strength training, some cardio, some just core exercises. So there's a wide range of them out there. And the good thing is that a lot of them are also uh, based on fitness levels or ability levels. So you can type in, you know, when you're doing your profile, are you someone who's a beginner? Are you advanced? And then the exercise routines can be tailored toward, toward your ability level. Um, most of these are like having a little personal trainer on your phone. They show you exactly what exercises to do, how long to do it for, how to warm up, how to cool down. So they're a really great option right now. And the one that I particularly like is the, the Johnson & Johnson 7-Minute Workout. Um, that one's a, a total body workout, has the, the timer right there on the screen, has a person showing you exactly how to do the exercise. And this is something that you could actually do multiple times if you want. So do the 7-Minute Workout, maybe take a minute or two break, and then do it again, or do it a third time. And now you've turned a 7-Minute Workout you know, into a 20-plus minute workout. And that's a great little workout for the day. So. Um, just tr try and find a few different apps that you that you feel comfortable with, that you feel are are tailored toward what your goals are, and I think that'll uh, that'll help kind of keep the keep the fitness level going. We want to bridge that gap until we can kind of get back to our normal routines with with uh, with our fitness. So, you know, that's all I have um, for my presentation here. But uh, I'm I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have, um, and I'm sure the other panelists are, are available to answer questions about any of the other talks or topics that you. You, uh, you they discussed so um, feel free to uh, to send those questions our way. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, this is Neil. I think we have a, a couple of minutes here just to get through a, a few questions. So I'll uh, I'll start by asking one that comes up. I'll start with Chris. So our patients often ask, uh, you know, all we can all I do is walk. Is that good enough? And and how would you counsel them on how to make that good enough for them? Yeah, so uh, going back to basically what the, number one, what their ability level is. So if it's someone who um, they've been walking for a while and they can tolerate that, then maybe it's time to sort of step it up a little bit. Maybe go, maybe exercise at a brisk pace, you know, make sure that your breathing has kind of picked up a little bit. Um, if you have a heart rate monitor, that's a great way to know if you're getting enough exercise, you're getting it at enough, at a high enough level. Um, so I think, you know, monitoring your heart rate, kind of checking your breathing rate to know that you're, you're at the proper level. Because um, some people, they, they, they've been doing the same activity year after year after year, and they won't necessarily get any additional benefits because the body has sort of leveled off. So if that's the case, then we want to challenge it a little bit to get additional benefits from, from the exercise. Yeah, and I would just, I would add, I think, uh, as we've talked about before, also walking to some other scales, if you don't have a heart rate monitor, if some, if you walk at a pace, if someone was talking with you, you'd be slightly out of breath or you, in, while talking on the phone or on a scale of one to 10, you'd rate it as a five to seven. Other, other, reason, other means to check your intensity. Um, Dan, I think we had a, a good question, a question that, uh, I actually have asked Fran as well before, is dark chocolate healthy for you? Um, we, I should say we're purchasing a lot more chocolate uh, these days than when we stock up. So what are your thoughts? It's a great question, Neil. Um, so uh, d let me first say uh, saturated fat, as I indicated, increases cholesterol level. There's several different saturated fatty acids 
And it's been well known that the major saturated fat in chocolate called stearic acid does not raise cholesterol levels. And the benefits of eating dark chocolate is that it has, it's rich in flavanols. Will you get the amount of flavanols that will be beneficial from snacking on chocolate? Probably not. Um, but it's as long as you eat it in moderation, it doesn't cause you to gain weight. It's a perfectly acceptable snack. Yeah, so that's a good question. And I think, Fran, I think you would agree that not all dark chocolate is created equal. Correct. So it's really important to look at the labels because some of them, real pure dark chocolate is, is quite bitter. It doesn't yeah. have a lot of added sugar to it. And some right. of the other commercial chocolates um, have quite a bit of sugar into it. And so, um, there's probably some difference there, but there is, like, there is some high-level data. I think Doug and Dan would agree. There is some data that suggests in, that dark chocolate consumption has been associated with decreases in heart disease. Um, very, very, very loosely, I, I should advocate, but um, it probably has to do with the, the flavanols, as you mentioned. Correct. Um, so, and if, if it's okay, I'll ask you one follow-up. So uh, the other vice that has been going along with chocolate um, in these times of COVID is alcohol. Um, I think everybody has been home more, uh, not naming any names, but certain parents may be consuming more alcohol to help cope with their uh, <laughs> situation with their kids. And, and so um, what are your thoughts or how do you advise um, people on how much alcohol is appropriate to consume? Well, it's one of the questions I ask on my initial counseling session with individuals. I usually ask them about their exercise patterns, but also alcohol, because it contributes calories to the diet. It can also um, increase for those patients who have elevated triglycerides, it can increase their triglyceride levels. So, um, but moderate drinking is a glass. Uh, a night for a woman or two alcoholic beverages a night for a male, but uh, it shouldn't be all seven on a Saturday night. That would be considered binge, a binge. Right, great, Doug, Dan, do you have anything to add or how, how do you guys approach alcohol? <laughs> so we often tell I patients, patients. <laughs> on average, three to five drinks a week, is not going to hurt you, and there's even a slight chance of health benefit. Once you go beyond that, the calories and the impact on other organs, such as liver and even cancer risk, probably outweigh the benefit. So it's like most other things in life in moderation. I wouldn't encourage someone to drink for the sake of heart benefit, but if you're keeping it in that three to five per week range, I don't think you're doing yourself any disservice. Great. Uh, so a couple other questions have trickled in. This one's for probably you, Chris. Is yoga good? Uh, the question is, does yoga exercise help with heart rate? Maybe you could just speak to, is yoga good for your heart and maybe how it might affect your heart rate? Yoga is yoga's always great. I mean, it, it's, it's challenging for a lot of people, uh, but you know, it's not necessarily going to raise the heart rate like, you know, an aerobic exercise would, um, you know, walking or running or cycling. Um, but it's great just in general for keeping proper range of motion, um, sort of teaching breathing technique. Um, so in general, I think from a from an exercise standpoint, I, it's, it's, it's a great add-in to exercise. Um, but I think we still need to have some type of an aerobic exercise uh, sessions throughout the week to get the cardiovascular benefits out of that. Um, so, you know, doing things where we get that heart rate elevated a little bit, um, kind of at least into that moderate range for that 150 minutes a week. That's really what we're looking for from a, a heart conditioning or a heart health standpoint. You know, yoga is definitely not going to hurt, but I think it's more of a supplemental um, it's not really going to necessarily train the heart um, the way aerobic exercise would. Yeah, that's great. And I would, I would add also that yoga has been increasingly studied in um, managing heart conditions as well as other conditions like cancer and side effects from chemotherapies. And 
we're seeing that, for example, yoga probably has some beneficial effects in certain irregular heart rhythms like atrial fibrillation. So there's probably um, a lot of added benefit from it, as you mentioned, Chris, both aerobically and maybe some of the core training and other aspects of it, the, the mindfulness. So uh, a great, great uh, question. Um, so I think one other um, question here that came up specifically is around the toprolol. And um, I think I'll, I'll share this with you because a lot of people are on medications that suppress your heart rate. So maybe you can, if you're taking with toprolol, which is a medicine that can suppress your heart rate, heart rate, how do you get your heart rate high enough to get a good workout? So um, maybe you could speak to that and more specifically, how can you measure if your workout is good enough for you? You know, outside of heart rate. That's coming to me, right? Is that? Yeah, that's you. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so, so that's that's actually one of the the common uh, scenarios that I deal with almost on a daily basis. Um, you know, patients taking beta blockers, um, and we we like to give heart rate ranges or recommend recommended heart rate ranges for patients to to exercise at. But yeah, the problem is that the beta blocker, you know, metoprolol those are going to change how the heart rate is affected in particular with exercise. And it really depends on the dose that, that the patient is taking. Um, you know, a, a very high dose of a beta blocker, it might be hard for a patient to get their heart rate above a hundred. They could, they could try to run down the street and their heart rate just will not go over a hundred. Um, and if that's the case, then I think we go back to some of the other uh, methods for, for measuring or, kind of assessing exercise intensity. So we use things called the rating of perceived exertion. So that's basically a scale from zero to 10, 10 being you feel like you are completely maxed out. Zero would be you're sitting on the couch and you feel completely relaxed. You know, we're looking for something kind of in that maybe five to six range to be what's considered moderate exercise. So even if your heart rate might not, might not mesh with the way you're feeling, at least you can kind of use that perceived exertion scale to say, wow, I feel like I'm, I'm exercising really hard here. Maybe I need to back off a little bit. Or you might say, hey, I feel like maybe a two or a three on this scale. I could probably ramp it up a little bit more because my breathing hasn't really changed much and I feel like I can tolerate more. So, so there's some alternative methods um, if heart rate isn't necessarily accurate or it's not responding the way we typically think it does because of a medication. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, I think maybe we can take probably the last couple here. Um, so here, here's one for you, Fran, um, specific to peanut butter, um, which I think a lot of people love and use to augment proteins. So even in the natural peanut butters, they have added palm oil. Uh, what is your thought on how much peanut butter is safe to have? It looks like from a saturated fat standpoint. This is specifically for vegetarians who would use this as their protein source. Yeah, I just start. I saw that on the chat. I just started to type uh, an answer. Um, again, a very good question. The reason why it's higher in palm oil is because the trans fats were taken out. Beginning in 2015, the FDA has ruled that uh, trans fats should be not generally recognized as safe because due to their lipid effects, not only were they increasing your bad or your LDL cholesterol, but they were decreasing your good cholesterol, your HDL cholesterol. Uh, so when we look at peanut butter, it is so high in monounsaturated fat compared to that saturated fat, uh, that it is considered heart healthy. And this is one of the reasons why we start talking about healthy dietary patterns instead of single foods. So nuts and peanut butter, even though they will be higher in saturated fat, should be included as a good uh, non-meat source of protein in a heart healthy diet. Great. A um, couple more questions here. So maybe this one for you, Doug. Please discuss precautions when bringing delivered packages and mail into the home. Sure. So right now we know that COVID-19 lives for a different length of time on different surfaces. The best estimate is that it lives on cardboard 
for ballpark 24 hours, whereas on glass, it could live for many days. So if we make the assumption that many packages coming to us are in the paper and cardboard category, I would assume that COVID could live for ballpark 24 hours. So that gives me the option. One is to almost quarantine your packages. And I would say if you have a little area in your garage and you could take it and just put it there and leave it there for two days and then wash your hands after touching it, two days later, it really should be safe to touch because you've outlasted the length of the virus on that surface. However, if your delivery is food, well, most of the time we're not going to just leave food out in our garage for uh, two days, in which case I would bring it in and wipe it down. As it relates to a prepackage, just use the wipes that are all out there over the internet that would actually work on killing COVID. So wipe down the surfaces carefully and then wipe down the surface where you did all that. If it was fresh vegetables and fresh fruit, I would actually wash them to clean off the surface. Um, Great, I think there's been a, a lot of chatter around that in general, so what, what the right answer is. So, um, so thanks, that's helpful, Doug. Um, Couple quick follow-ups. So Chris, a follow-up sounds like to the yoga question. What about Pilates? Does it help raise your heart rate? Yeah, so I mean, Pilates is great. I mean, Pilates is a you know, much more of a core-based um, exercise program and, and you're using, using body weight and leverage. So there's sort of a, an isometric muscle contracting component to that. And that can actually drive the heart rate and the blood pressure up a little bit higher um, than sort of normal, you know, strength, strengthening exercises do. Um, so you'll, you'll probably get some, some heart rate elevation out of that, but again, it's not going to be probably a sustained, uh, rise in heart rate, um, that like we would get from an aerobic exercise. So it's great for core strength, um, you know, muscle, muscle strengthening, um, but it's probably not going to be equivalent to an aerobic exercise session. Great. Yeah, and, and I would just add that and that's it's a different type type of fitness, but which is just as important, I think you mm -hmm. would agree. Right. Exactly. So great. Mm -hmm. Um so maybe we can make these our last two questions here. Um one for each of you, Chris and Fran, and Doug, maybe you can weigh in. Um so the first is sh for you, Chris, short of a VO2 max test, which is the best formula to determine max your maximum heart rate? Um, and this is in reference to as an athlete without any you know, current heart issues. But, but I think this question comes up commonly, you know, what, what should, how, what is my target heart rate and, and right. how do I with the exercise? Yeah, so we, so we know, you know, the, the common formula out there is 220 minus your age, but we also know that, that that's ballpark, right? That works for probably 80% of the population and there's always going to be those that have a higher or lower than expected max heart rate. So if you're, if you're an athlete, completely healthy, you know, no risk factors. You know, one of the things that we, from an exercise physiology standpoint, what we recommend is that essentially if you can go on a, maybe a half mile run, or if you live somewhere near like a high school track or a college track, um, and essentially what you would want to do is monitor your heart rate, you know, with a chest strap or with a, with a heart rate monitor on your, on your wrist. And basically you want to do a full out sprint. Now, this is if, if obviously if there's no other, no other issues, you're not, not have high blood pressure, no arrhythmias. If you're completely healthy, you want to challenge yourself a little bit. You can actually do a, do a sprint, see how high your heart rate gets, okay? And then taper down from that your normal training uh, heart rate ranges um, and to see how high the heart rate goes. Um, now, I wouldn't recommend this for, for cardiac patients or people that have orthopedic limitations. Uh, just because the risk is higher uh, of, of something happening. But if you're a young, healthy college age, or even maybe in your early 30s and, and no issues, then some people like to challenge themselves with these short sprints to see how high their heart rate goes. And that's much more specific to you than using a 220 minus your age uh, as a ballpark. So it's one of the methods that we use in the exercise world. Um, if we don't do a max VO2 test or some other type of maximum test out there, so. Great, thank you, Chris. And um, so our last question here um, for Fran and um, maybe Doug as well in the prevention world. Uh, what do you think of insure, the Insure branded low carb 
type drinks as a meal for substitute, or as a meal substitute, I should say. The Ensure? Yeah. E-N-S-U-R-E, the... Um, sure, that's right. Um, I, I think it's fine. It really depends on uh, what you're using it for. Is it for weight loss? Um, I think meal replacements have a role. Um, so I think it's fine. I don't know what you think, Doug. Um, I usually think about just total intake into the body. So I still right. think people, assuming they don't have any true dietary restrictions, should be vegetable based and then balance out everything else. If using Ensure to help control your caloric intake and specifically if using a low carb version helps you avoid excess carbs, I have no objection to that. But I just take that as part of the daily puzzle of what you're putting in your body. So I don't think Ensure is different. It's just a matter of what technique works for you when you're trying to stay healthy. Um, and with that question, probably why don't we wind this down? Um, thank you to everyone participating. Um, Dan Soffer had to leave to go see patients. So he checked out a couple minutes ago. Um, once again, thanks to um, the Linda and Abby and your teams for planning this and arranging the webinar. Thanks to the audience for coming and listening to us. And we're available by phone and by MyPen Medicine uh, to continue to answer questions for you guys. So thanks, be safe and be healthy.